And it's been four months. Can you believe how t fast time goes? Especially when you get to my age, man. These months go by like, like weeks used to go by. How many here for the first time? First time. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, you're kind of in the middle of a series. What we're doing is we're going through the top archaeological discoveries in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And we've done seven of these lessons. We're not even out of the Torah yet. We're still in like Deuteronomy, all right? There's so much evidence that supports what the scriptures say that so far, as I say, we've been through seven of these lessons. And the way these things go is we go through a lesson and then we, uh, we uh, have some time for Q&A, comments, that kind of thing. We even have people watching out there in internet land right now. They can text not text, they can put their questions in the YouTube or maybe even the Facebook uh, comment section. Just put in big capital letters, question, and we may get to your questions as well. All right, so we've got a lot to cover tonight because Richard Dawkins has a problem. I, got, I don't know if you know who Richard Dawkins is. Most of you do. He's probably the most well-known atheist in the world. And he wrote a book back in 2006 called The God Delusion. He thinks you're deluded if you believe in God. And here's what he says about the God of the Old Testament. He says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, right? Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And those are his good qualities, according to Dawkins. Now, Dawkins has a way with words, right? And he is a very good writer, and if you just take a cursory view of the Old Testament, it's really kind of hard to disagree with Dawkins on some of these things, right? There's a lot of sex that God doesn't like. There's a lot of violence God appears to like. What's the deal with that? In fact, one of the, uh, one of the questions we're going to try and deal with, maybe the only question we're going to try and deal with tonight is, why is there so much sex and violence in the Old Testament? And Christians have been struggling in many cases to try and explain this. Why is it? Why does God seem that he wants to kill everyone, particularly in the Old Testament? In fact, one of the passages that is very well known is Deuteronomy chapter 7, which says this. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Gergesites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, Termites, all these people, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them and total and destroy them totally, make no treaty with them and show no mercy. This is the God of love? Really? Destroy them. Other places, he says, kill all the women and children. Kill all the livestock. Burn everything down. What? This is the God of the Bible. Then he has a big problem with sex, as you know. In fact, Leviticus 18 is the chapter where God lists all of the sexual practices that he says you ought not engage in. And he basically says in the intro to this chapter, do not do as the Egyptians and the Canaanites do. Now, the Canaanites were in the land that we now call Israel. Prior to Israel uh, returning from the Exodus, and uh, they apparently were doing some evil things. Because here's what God says you ought not do uh, because the Canaanites and the Egyptians were doing this. Don't sleep with relatives, with your parents, with your stepmother, your sister or half-sister, your grandchildren, your sister by marriage, aunt on father's side, aunt on mother's side, uncle on father's side, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, mother and granddaughter, two sisters if they're both alive. During a menstrual cycle, neighbor's wife, don't sacrifice your, ch your, your children to Molech. You can't get involved in homosexuality and bestiality is out as well. These are all wrong according to Yahweh. Now, as you look at this list, by the way, 
And there are, I think, 17 prohibitions on this list, specific prohibitions. How many of them do you disagree with? How many of them does our culture disagree with? Which ones? Menstrual cycle, perhaps? Homosexuality? Anything else? Yeah, we're, we're, uh, no, our, our culture, well, some say, yeah, we do want to sacrifice our children to Molech or to our own convenience. But most of these, even people in America would agree with now. Why do you think all these are written in the Bible then? Why do they even need to be in there? Do you have to be told not to have sex with your aunt? Your, grand, your, your grandchildren? Now, notice... These are death penalty offenses, not just for the Canaanites, but for Israel too. If you get involved in those things, in the theocracy of Israel, you are to be killed. And by the way, a Canaanite town was Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you know that? So they were doing some evil things in this town and throughout the land of Canaan. In fact, here's what he says at the end of the chapter. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin and the land, I love this term, vomited out. The land vomited out its inhabitants, this description here. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. So God is serious about doing violence and also sexual immorality. You can't get involved in sexual immorality. Now, why so? Well, how do we answer the question, why is there so much sex and violence in the Old Testament? You know where the answer is? The answer is in archaeology. Because if you look at archaeology, you're going to get some context so you can realize why God is speaking about these issues and why he's speaking about them in this very stern, black and white way. So for lesson number eight in digging up the Bible, we're going to look at archaeology but if we're going to look at archaeology with regard to sex and violence, we have a warning. This is certainly rated PG-13. So when this show makes it to TV, parents, if you're watching this now and you have kids in the room, keep them there because they're going to want to stay. <laughs> no, you're going you're to have to say uh, you might want to uh, watch this first and later if you think your kids can handle it, watch it again. And by the way, we're going to be correct, not politically correct. Because uh, many archaeologists will not say what we're going to say here. Because, well, you'll see when we get into it. You'll see why they try and avoid the obvious conclusion. So, the answer is in archaeology. Now, in order to, uh, to do this, let's go back to something we did several years ago in here. We talked about how to interpret a Bible verse. And we said there are no verses in the Bible. The chapter and verse divisions were put in 500 years ago to help us navigate the text. So when people pull verses out of context to try and say something, if they pull them out of context and you don't really know what the verse means in context, you're going to get the wrong meaning. And we had an acronym we used to try and show you an easy way to try and discover what the verse actually means. It's not what the verse means to you. It's what the verse meant to the guy writing it down whether it's Moses or Paul or Matthew or Luke or whoever we're talking about. And this acronym was STOP, S-T-O-P. Whenever you come across a Bible passage, you have to stop and do four things. Does anyone remember what this stands for? S stands for the situation. The T stands for what type of literature is it. The O stands for what's, or who is the object of the passage. Is the object of the passage everyone? Is it just ancient Israel? Is it uh, a church in Corinth? Is it uh, some guy in Rome by the name of Rufus? Because, <laughs> I mean, there are some passages that say, greet Rufus, <laughs> right? Have you greeted Rufus today? You haven't? You're in sin. No, you have to know uh, who the passage is written to, and then you want to discover if the passage is descriptive or prescriptive. Most of the Bible, I would say, 
Yeah, probably most of the Bible. The majority of the Bible is just descriptive. It's not prescriptive. You know, you read about David committing adultery. It's just a description. He doesn't want us to commit adultery. And so when you go through a passage, try and figure out what the situation is. What's going on at the time? If you don't know what's going on at the time, much of the Old Testament is going to seem crazy. And so what, are gonna, what we're going to try and do in this session is give you the situation that was going on in about 1400 or so B.C. when Moses is writing the first five books of the Old Testament. And at some point we'll get into the authorship. Was it really Moses? Yes, but we'll get into it later. All right, now, what is the situation in this land that Moses is trying to bring the people to? Well, there are many gods out there, but he, these are the big three that the Canaanites were worshiping. Baal, Asherah, and Molech. Baal, Asherah, and Molech. And when you read through the Old Testament, you're going to see these names pop up. Like, who are these? What are, who are these spiritual beings? What, what is the deal with these gods? Well, we're going to see what the practices of people that worship these idols actually engaged in. What were these practices? And when we see these practices, we're going to realize, ah, this is why God is saying this at this time to these people. If you don't know the situation, it's going to seem crazy. But once you do know the situation, you're going to go, oh, I see why he's commanding that. So let's take a look at Baal first. I could list many passages. Here's just one related to Baal. While Israel was saying it was staying in Chittim. Now, this is a place that they were staying during the 40 years of wandering, which was probably Saudi Arabia, not the Sinai Peninsula, as we talked about a couple of lessons ago. Anyway, while they were staying there, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods, so Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. Now, there were many Baals out there. Normally, they may have been associated with a city or an area. So this Baal, this idol of this area, they began to worship. Now, what do we know about Baal from outside the Bible? Well... Let's go to Ugarit, which is in modern-day Syria, because they've discovered about 1,500 cuneiform tablets that tell you about Baal, the Baal cycle. I'll explain what that is in a minute. This was discovered in 1929 by H.J. Franken in this area now called Rosh Shamara, Syria. And Baal was a Canaanite fertility and storm god who became the high god by, de by defeating his, uh, his father in this, in this mythology. Now, these are nature gods. What do we mean by nature gods? What are nature gods? Yeah, the god of the sun, like Ra would be a nature god of, uh, in Egypt, right? Baal here, uh, being a storm god, well, he would bring rain. Well, you need to grow your crops. Or it, and sometimes he's affiliated with a fertility god. You, you want to have a children? You, you, you pray to Baal, that kind of thing. Same thing with Asherah, okay? So they're nature gods. They think, because they believe in cause and effect, that there's got to be some sort of cause for why we get rain. Well, maybe it's this nature god that brings rain, okay? So that's who they set up this idol to, and they pray to, and they sacrifice to. Uh, and this Baal usurped his brother through sexual conquest. So we're about to see here in a few minutes that these Baal worshipers are really into certain sexual practices. And when Baal triumphed, a seven-year cycle of fertility would ensue, but if not, seven years of drought and famine would ensue. So this was a cycle. It happened every seven years, I suppose, that this would occur. And so they'd try and root for Baal to win. And this is the most well-known writing in cuneiform, the Ugaritic text. There's about 1,500 of these writings. Now, here's a sample of the Baal cycle that was found in these cuneiform inscriptions. By the way, here's a Baal statue 
found among these Ugarit uh, ruins. And here's a ball with a thunderbolt, also found over the same ruins. Here is a sampling. Mightiest ball hears. He makes love with a heifer in the outback, a cow in the field of death's realm. He lies with her 70 times 7, mounts 80 times 8. She conceives and bears a boy. So he has sex with a cow over and over again. You guys are squeamish or what? I mean, you're going... Well, that's what happens with Baal. But there's a lot more to this. You're saying, why is he having sex with a cow? Here's why. The wider story here involves his sister, Anath, incarnating as a calf for a cow. To her surprise, Baal finds her and rapes her hundreds of times over while she's in an an animal form. He also regularly had sex with his daughter. Once Baal took the throne, defeating his brother and conquering his father, then he took his own mother to be his wife consort. So you've got incest and bestiality throughout Baal worship. So you can see why, if this is going on in Israel, Yahweh wants nothing to do with this. He doesn't want any of the Israelites to get involved in this. So the biblical significance is, The fact that the biblical writers were familiar with these neighboring religious cultures and practices, and it helps explain why Baal worship was so detestable, because you got bestiality, incense, rape, and why the prohibitions were so extreme. Also, the phrase, whoring after other gods, wasn't a metaphor. They were actually doing that. In fact, there have been phallic symbols found all over Israel. These, according to the National Geographic, who had, I guess, an archaeologist tell them this, in prehistoric graves long before Abraham and uh, the patriarchs, they had all these phallic figurines and oddly arranged human uh, remains in Israel. Now, this dating is probably way too early. They really don't know how old this was. This maybe could have been during the time of the patriarchs. But sex was a really big deal in Baal worship. So, God wasn't too happy with that. All right, how about Asherah? This is uh, a goddess who is a goddess of fertility and you may have also heard, or when you read the Bible, you'll t- you'll, it'll, they'll be talking about Asherah poles. Take your Asherah poles down. What was that? There is some controversy here because it's unclear whether the Israelites were worshiping this goddess Asherah or whether they were using these poles or trees that represented Asherah as a form of worship. There's some controversy here. But in any event, it's something that Yahweh wanted them to have nothing to do with. I could list scores of passages, but here's just one. Well, maybe a dozen or so. Here's just one. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord, their God, and Serve the Baals and the Asherahs. That's from Judges. You know the whole story of the book of Judges. There's no king in Israel. This is after they get in the land. They're all broken up into tribes. And the last verse of the entire book of Judges tells you what it's all about. That they, everyone just did what was right in their own eyes. Kind of sounds like America now, doesn't it? You just do what's right in your own eyes. There's no objective right and wrong. You just do what's right in your own eyes. In any event, marriage, marriage, in this case, when they're marrying people of other religions, it creates a problem, and it still creates a problem today, doesn't it? Marriage is hard enough, but when you have somebody you're married to who doesn't share your beliefs, it makes it even more difficult, doesn't it? This is why the Lord says, don't be unequally yoked in marriage. I give you one command, just marry somebody in the Lord. In any event, what have we found with regard to Asherahs outside of the Bible? Well, this was discovered actually in the Sinai Peninsula, kind of in the northeastern corner of the Sinai Peninsula in 1975. These paintings from the 9th century B.C. And at this place, 
pithoi, storage jars with explicit images were painted on the sides. And two characters without pants lustily watch a mother cow suckle her calf. I don't know what the deal is with cows. But they have some kind of thing for cows. And on this jar, it's labeled Yahweh and his Asherah. In other words, they, were, they seem to be combining worship of Yahweh with worship of this Asherah goddess, or using the pole, the Asherah pole. And they're basically saying here, it seems, and again, this is controversial, did Yahweh have a wife? Of course, the Israelites don't believe that, but were some of the Israelites at the time thinking he had a wife? Because all of the cultures around them, remember, their God isn't outside the universe who speaks and creates the universe. Their gods are inside the universe. They're finite. Note, in Canaanite legend, goddesses sometimes took the form of a cow. Now, you want to see what this looks like? It's hard to see. This is a family show, so we have taken the appropriate, taken the appropriate censorship here. But they're lustily looking out after this cow who is, this calf who is basically drinking from his mother. And this is supposed to be some sort of representation of Yahweh and his wife. So what's the biblical significance? This corroborates the biblical warnings about Asherah cult worship and its sexually explicit nature, and it illustrates Israel's idolatry, blending their religion with others, and this is also attested to in Scripture. So we see things outside of Scripture telling us that what Scripture says actually was going on. In fact, here is a, uh, it's called a cult stand, and if you look at the bottom here, these are uh, four tiers to it. This is Asherah here holding her breasts with two lions next to her. Yahweh is supposed to be here. Now, Yahweh is not represented by anything. Why? Because Yahweh is not a physical being. And then you've got Asherah again, this time represented by a tree. And it looks like there's some kind of sun disk up here. In any event, this was this is a thousand. This is about the time of David or so, 11th or 10th century B.C. This Asherah uh, cult stand, and then uh, there's been thousands of these phallic figurines found all over Israel, and it's some say that some of the people with these phallic figurines would stimulate themselves in order to attract the favor of the gods. And sometimes they would take these phallic symbols and put them in their field like an antenna trying to attract their god to take care of their crops. And even these are controversial, but you can see, and why are they controversial? Why do you think they're controversial? I keep saying they're, things, things are controversial. Because, well, sometimes we just don't know. But other times, there are people who don't want to affirm what the Old Testament says. Remember, we talked probably in the first show, there's a difference between archaeologists who are minimalists and those who are maximalists. Minimalists, they don't think hardly anything in the Scriptures are true. Maximalists say a lot of what's in the Scripture is true. And, of, of course, there's probably people in between. In fact, some maximalists, of course, are inerrantists. In any event, the point here is, is that this was associated with Asherah, these kind of sexual figurines. Uh, in fact, this is why Yahweh wasn't happy with it. This is, this is Deuteronomy 7 again. We read from this earlier. Just a few verses later. This is what you are to do with them. The Canaanites break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And ultimately to bring the Messiah forth so all nations could be blessed as he promised to Abraham. But you can see, now you're starting to get some context, right? You're starting to get the situation. 
what's going on in the land that God would have them write these laws? Now, maybe the most, uh, the most notorious of the gods is Molech. How many have heard of Molech? You probably have heard of Molech because Molech was the child sacrifice god that the Amorites and the Ammonites and others in the area would worship. And we'll get to the structure of it. Sometimes he's also represented as a serpent. Now we're going to look at three places where child sacrifice appears to be unequivocal. Two of them are outside of Israel. One is inside of Israel. And here's what God says about uh, sacrificing your children. This is from Deuteronomy 12. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. Now, where do we see this? We see it unequivocally in Ammon, Jordan. Some of us are going to be going to uh, Israel and we're going to fly out of Amman. Well, right practically in the middle of town in Amman, Jordan, there's something uh, known as the Amman Citadel, this area right in here. And archaeologists have discovered that there's evidence of child sacrifice in here. And uh, this goes all the way back to the 1400s B.C., discovered by Siegfried Horn in 1968. Here's what he discovered. The Amman Temple, where over a thousand bone fragments were found, mostly human. And all the fragments were burned. This is a ritual sacrifice. This is just a cemetery. They're burning, not in cremation. They're burning them as part of a ritual some sort of religious sacrifice is going on. The inscription indicates, or the inscription dedicates the temple to Molech. And it's spelled in many different ways. And this name, Molech, appears in the Bible several times. So it's dedicated to Molech, and the people who worship Molech would often sacrifice their children to him and of course the significance is is that the canaanite child sacrifice to molech happened as scripture reports and it therefore explains why we have laws against this i mean why would god say don't sacrifice your children to molech unless somebody was doing that right that's why it's in there now let's go across the med to uh, Carthage, which is present-day Tunisia. This would also now be known as Tunis in northern Africa. And what they found there was basically an entire area dedicated to child sacrifice. And uh, this is called Tophet, which in... Um, in Hebrew, means burned fireplace drum or shamed. It refers to a religious burial ground or cemetery for ritual child sacrifice. This was excavated for about 50 years from the 1920s to the 1970s in Tunisia. And this goes back to the 8th century B.C. So this is probably the most famous and largest area of sacrifice, child sacrifice ever discovered. It was long rumored to practice child sacrifice, Carthage was, and this finding confirms it. In fact, this is a jar, and inside this jar are the burned remains of infants. And they found apparently a lot of these. And these infants, we know it wasn't a cemetery, because these infants were all between one month and a month and a half old. And how could they determine that? They look at the teeth, and they could figure how old they were. No, there's a lot of uh, infant mortality back. Yeah, there were, they were, but they didn't all die between one month and a, a month and a half. These are sacrificed children to Molech. So what is the significance of this? Scripture accurately describes the practice of burning children. 
The inhabitants of Carthage were originally Canaanites who practiced child sacrifice to Molech. The people that settled here came out of basically what we would call northern Israel, uh, Lebanon, Syria. They were Phoenicians. And they went to Carthage and brought the practice that they took from the Holy Land. They took it to what we now know as Tunisia. Also, combining the biblical records with the Tophet at Carthage, we can see that there is human child sacrifice that really happened and it lasted at least a thousand years. So those are two places outside of Israel that show child sacrifices going on. What about inside of Israel? Again, we're looking at Molech. And here is a place where Molech is actually mentioned in the Old Testament. This is from Leviticus 18. We just read that passage. I just summarized it before. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. If you sacrifice your children for any reason, you're profaning the name of the Lord. Children are a blessing from the Lord. I know when they're two, you don't think so, but no, they are. Well, I don't know about that, um, but the point here is, is that child sacrifice is going on, and I wouldn't be surprised if pedophilia was going on. But, of course, back at that period, uh, basically you were of ma married, marriage age as soon as you're a woman, as soon as you started menstruating. So a little different than today. In any event, why is he saying this for Israel? Now let's go to Israel and the biblical town known as Gezer. Now where is Gezer? Let's zoom in a little bit on Gezer. Israel is not a big place. It's about the size of New Jersey. And a Gezer is actually between what we would call now Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And for those of you that go to Israel, you fly into Tel Aviv and then you, if you go to Jerusalem right away, it takes you 45 minutes, maybe an hour to get to Jerusalem. It's not very far. Well, kind of in between is this town known as Gezer. And uh, Gezer was also along a path up to the north. If you were coming from, say, Egypt and you wanted to go to Asia, you would come right along this path past Megiddo and on up past uh, past Capernaum, which Jesus made his hometown. Why? Because a lot of people passed that way on their way to Asia. And so Gezer was the place that the Amorites lived. And it was kind of in the hill country. And back in 1902, a Irish archaeologist by the name of R.A. Stuart McAllister began excavating at Gezer. And he discovered these 10 standing stones at Gezer. And what, what significance did these stones have? Well, this archaeologist by the name of Joel Kramer, who actually, he's American, but he lives in the Middle East. He's been living in Jordan for a long time. He lived in Jerusalem. And he's got a great YouTube channel called Expedition Bible where he goes in to some of the archaeological discoveries, and he goes to these locations, and he kind of unpacks the essentials of what you need to know. And he also has this very well-done book called Where God Came Down, the Archaeological Evidence. I'm going to have him on the podcast here soon. Uh, if you go to his uh, YouTube channel, you'll see a thumbnail that looks like this, Child Sacrifice, and it uh, talks about what was discovered at Gezer. Now what, in this little video, I'm going to show you about four minutes of it. It's actually a 17-minute video. I'm just going to show you. We don't have time to do all 17. I'm just going to show you the kind of the core of the video of what McAllister discovered. And if you notice as you're watching this, 
Joel Kramer is going to read from McAllister's report that he put together after he excavated there. And the chapter from which he's reading is called The Iniquity of the Amorite. The Iniquity, that's the title he gave to the chapter. What does that make you think of? Does that make you think of anything? The Iniquity of the Amorite. It's actually a phrase found in Genesis 15. I'll get to that a little bit later. But watch closely what McAllister found and how he interpreted what he found. And what Kramer's going to do is say it looks like McAllister was right because archaeologists after him tried to come in and say he didn't have it right. And why did they say he didn't have it right? We'll talk about it after the video. All right. Again, it's only about four minutes. You got to watch closely. There's a lot going on. He's at the site, and he's going to, first thing he's going to show you is the size of the stones themselves. Here it is. I just want you to look at how big these stones are. So, in his excavation report, McAllister found a pit which he described as being filled with a great number of bones of human beings in a confused heap. And nearby was the skeleton of a young girl who had evidently been sawn us under. She had been cut in half and found along with this, the skulls of two other girls who had been decapitated. And this could be determined because of the cut marks through the vertebrae. And then McAllister says that all around the feet of the columns, that is the standing stones, McAllister discovered the skeletons of young infants. They were deposited in large jars and the skeletons showed marks of fire. He started finding all over the place here around the base of these pillars, jars with burned human babies inside of them. Okay, and this is from his excavation report. You can see the skeletal remains of a burned baby inside of the jar. Buried ritually, not just buried, but buried ritually. Now, how are they buried ritually? They're buried in a, in a place of sacrifice, in a sacred place of worship. So in his excavation report, McAllister made a plan of the high place from the perspective of looking straight down on it. And then on this top plan, he marked with the letter J everywhere where he had found these infant jar burials. Look at all the J's, J, 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 J. See all the J's? Jar burials with not just baby bones in them, burned baby bones in them. Okay, this is about a seven, six, seven year old girl that was cut in half. You can tell, by the way, when they're cut um, in half because you have a cut mark right through the vertebrae, right through the bones. Below this area, McAllister discovered a cave. And when his team cleared it, a flat stone was found at the center of the cave. Still lying upon it were the remains of the skeleton of a human infant. I know this is sobering. I know you're not having a good time, but you either want to know what's actually found in the ground or you don't. And it's important to know what's actually found in the ground. So essentially for McAllister, it was like excavating a crime scene. What happened here? What was going on? And so he had the evidence, but he still needed to interpret it. And what McAllister used to interpret what he'd found in the ground was the Bible. Numbers 13.29 says that the Amorites live in the hill country of Canaan. Since Gezer was located in the hill country of Canaan, he interpreted it to be an Amorite city. So who were the Amorites? They were Canaanites. Why? Because they descended from the man Canaan. And the Amorites were the most powerful of the Canaanite tribes. McAllister used Exodus 23 that mentions the Amorite sacred stones to identify the row of sacred stones he had unearthed at Gezer. 
The other large stone with a flat top he identified as an altar, and the purpose of its carved out basin was for catching the blood of sacrifices. Based on these verses, McAllister knew the site he was excavating was a Canaanite high place where Amorites had worshipped their gods. The many idols found in the area provided evidence that this was a cultic site. Among the many idols that were found was a bronze serpent representing Moloch, the king of the Amorite gods. Remember reading about Moloch in the Bible? This is how he is represented, a snake. Who do you think the snake is that's getting the Canaanites to sacrifice their own children? In Deuteronomy 12, 31, the Lord says to the Israelites, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. Using this verse and others like it, McAllister labeled the picture of the remains of a burned human baby as a sacrificed infant buried in a jar. The severed human remains he also interpreted as evidence for child sacrifice. What was the crime? Child sacrifice. What was the evidence? the remains of sacrificed children. Think about it, what other explanation is there for burned babies in a jar around standing stones? What other explanation is there? You know of any? You know when that, uh, they find something like this and they don't like where it's going, what do they tend to do? They ignore it. They try and come up with some other interpretation. Because Christianity really is the only worldview that gets human nature right. What's human nature? We're evil. It's easy to be bad. It's hard to be good. But many people out there want to say human nature is good. They would never do this. Who's going to burn their babies? Who's going to sacrifice their babies? And they don't want the Bible to be true, so let me come up with some sort of other interpretation. By the way, the iniquity of the Amorites, where does that come from? You remember what God promised to Abraham? He told Abraham, you're going to have many descendants. They're going to be taken to Egypt, but they're going to come back. And here was the promise. Your descendants shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In other words, yes, the Amorites were doing evil, but God was not going to judge them just yet. He was going to give them time. Now, this isn't the only place in Israel that child sacrifice has been discovered. Does anyone know who this lady is? She looks like Sanger, doesn't she? No. This is one of the most famous archaeologists of the last century, Kathleen Kenyon, who dug at Jericho and several other places, digging up Jericho. And Kathleen Kenyon, who was no friend of the Bible, actually said in her, her report, there is an unpleasant suggestion of child sacrifice in Jericho. Jericho was an Amorite city. Who was an Amorite in the bloodline of Jesus? Rahab. Or did they, did they classify her as a Moabitist? Or that's Ruth. Ruth is a Moabitist. I think Rahab, we can look this up. I think Rahab is an Amorite. I know that Jericho is an Amorite city. And even Kathleen Kenyon seemed to discover that Molech was being sacrificed too. Who's Molech? Here's a drawing of Molech. Molech was a metal idol with a kind of bull's head and a human body and the arms outstretched. 
and they would heat, they'd put fire in the base of this idol, they'd heat it up, and then they would put the, the sacrificed children on the, the sizzling hot arms of Molech and watch the baby basically be burned to death. And it's not just in the Bible. Plutarch, who was a Greek writer, who wrote in about 100 AD, speaks of Molech-like sacrifice. I believe this is from Carthage, or maybe Alexandria. It's in northern Africa where he's writing about this. And the god who was the equivalent of Molech to the Greeks was Kronos. And here is what Plutarch wrote about this. He said, with full knowledge and understanding, they themselves offered up their own children. And those who had no children would buy little ones from poor people and cut their throats as if they were, as if they were so many lambs or young birds. Meanwhile, the mother stood by without a tear or moan. But should she utter a single moan or let fall a single tear, she had to forfeit the money and her child was sacrificed nevertheless. And the whole area before the statue was filled with a loud noise of flutes and drums so that the cries of the wailing should not reach the ears of the people. So just play your instruments louder so the people won't hear their own children screaming on the molten hot arms of Molech. Plutarch. Plutarch was a Greek writer. He wrote several biographies in about the first century AD. And there's reference to this even earlier. I saw one earlier today from uh, about 300 BC. These are not biblical sources, as you can see. This is being seen from outside the Bible. And guess who else did this? Judah did this. Many of the kings. Solomon did this. Manasseh did this. Ahab did this. Josiah stopped it, but then it was picked up again. This is from Jeremiah 7. The people of Judah have sinned before my very eyes, says the Lord. They have set up their abominable idols, abominable, easy for me to say, abominable idols in the temple that bears my name, defiling it. They have built pagan shrines at Tophet, the garbage dump in the valley of Ben Hinnom, which is in the south side of Jerusalem. And they burn their sons and daughters in the fire. I've never commanded such a horrible deed. It never even crossed my mind to command such a thing. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to judge Judah. And this is why Jeremiah was not a popular prophet. That's why they threw him in a cistern. Because he was bad for the morale of Judah. He's going around saying, you guys are committing evil. Stop whoring after other gods. Start following Yahweh. If you don't, you're going to be judged. And what was the judgment Jeremiah was speaking of? The exile in 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar came in and wiped out, Israel, wiped out Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took many Israelites all the way to Babylon, including Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Tibet we go. All those folks. In fact, they've actually taken some of what has been discovered at Gezer and laid it out. You saw the infant in the burial jar. He found several of those jars, as you remember. You remember the seven-year-old girl who was uh, sawed in half. There were two others who were decapitated. They've actually tried to lay out the bones to see what had been discovered. It's gruesome. Actually, not all of these are from Gezer. These last two are from abortion clinics in America. The 
we any better than the Amorites? You know, when they do a uh, DC abortion, they cut the baby up inside the womb, and then they have to count the body parts they pull out to make sure they don't leave any in there. This is a saline solution. They just burn the baby to death. Sound familiar? In the name of liberty, we get to dismember our children. These are the Amorites. These are the Americans. There's not a dime's bit of difference between them. Is there? Even one of the uh, early church apologists, Tertullian, said it doesn't matter for what reason you kill your child, whether it's for ritual sacrifice or just for your own convenience, you're still a murderer. We're no better. Human nature hasn't changed. Do you see now why God gave Israel the Mosaic Law and judged people doing such evil? I mean, you, we were all probably sitting here going, yeah, the Amorites deserve to be destroyed. So do we. How much longer do you think America's going to last? I don't know. But if we keep going down the road we're going, we're going to be judged as well. By the way, Old Testament violence is judgment. It's not genocide. You know, God did the same thing to the Israelites. When the Israelites began worshiping the golden calf, what did God tell Moses to do? Kill those 3,000 that did. It's capital punishment. It's not genocide. If it was genocide, it would just be one group of people. He's in the theocracy of ancient Israel where his presence was demonstrated day after day. If they disobeyed with a capital offense, then they were executed. And it's up to God to judge when that happens. You know, if Christianity is true, people don't die. They just change location. They just go from this life to the next life, and it's up to God when that happens. Yet it's amazing how many people today complain about the God of the Old Testament when, in fact, they play God themselves. I was at a college, I think it was in Oklahoma, where a young woman got up to the microphone and she said, I can't believe in a God who would kill people like the God of the Bible in the Old Testament. And so I had a discussion with her. This went on for 11 minutes. It's on our YouTube channel. And at the end of it, I said, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, where do you stand on the abortion issue? She said, oh, I'm pro-choice. So I said to her, why is it that when God plays God in the Old Testament and decides who lives and dies, he's immoral. But when you play God here on earth and decides who lives and dies by abortion, somehow that's your moral right. Can you justify that for me? You have a moral right to decide who lives and dies, but God doesn't? I think they got that backwards, don't they? Look, if God is the creator, and he is, he has right over life. He can decide at any point to take us out, right now or at any time. He, he's under no obligation to keep us alive. And he could judge all of us right now. And it would be fair, right, and just, but God is also loving, and he wants to give us more time, particularly those of us who haven't accepted he wants to give us more time. And for those of, us, those of us who have, maybe he's given us more time so we can bring more people into the kingdom and become more like Jesus as we do. 
By the way, the atheists have no moral standard by which to judge God, do they? There's nothing right or wrong unless God exists. How can you say God is immoral if there is no God? Nothing's moral or immoral. Everything is just a matter of opinion. Now, he had to do this because the situation was these evil things were being done. My mentor, Dr. Norman Geiser, used to say this. He said it took one night to get Israel out of Egypt. It took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And even then it didn't work. They had the Mosaic Law and they kept whoring after other gods. They kept being disobedient to the point where the northern kingdom was judged in 722 B.C. and the southern kingdom was judged in 586 B.C. And then the entire nation again was judged in 70 A.D. just as Jesus said it would be judged. And it never came again together until 1948. 1900 years out of the land. So the law of Moses is a revelation from God to make Israel a holy nation of priests that would show our need for Christ and it's a polemic against the gods and behaviors of the Canaanites. In other words, it's also a corrective to what was going on at the, going on at the time. So when Richard Dawkins or any atheist says anything like this, First of all, they don't have a standard by which to say that. But secondly, they just don't understand the situation. And if you don't understand the situation, you're going to look at the text and go, this is crazy. Yeah, but you're doing the same thing right now, aren't you? You're doing exactly what the Amorites did. You're killing your own children. Not actually as a sacrifice to God, but as a sacrifice to your own convenience, to your own goals, because your child is just too inconvenient. Now, by the way, whenever you talk about abortion, you have to say, rightfully so, that you can put all of that under the cross of Christ, that if anyone here has participated or encouraged in abortion, you're forgiven because Christ has already paid the price. But I'm saying this for people who are thinking about doing it right now. It's never the right answer. If your solution to your problem is your own dead child, you've got the wrong solution. So, questions for that cheery, cheery presentation. Yes, sir, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry, we got people watching out there, too. What, um, what do you mean by that? Just mystical gods, what do you mean? It seems like these are actual demonic forces named these... Oh, they gods. well could be. They well could represent demonic forces. You know about the divine council that uh, is talked about in Psalm 82 and Psalm 89 and also is referenced in Deuteronomy 32 that, yeah, there are demonic forces out there that can be represented by Baal, Asherah, and Molech. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. Yeah. By the way, i got to say one other thing that I'd failed to say in the bulk of the presentation. You know, when I put up the first verse that we had up there earlier, Deuteronomy 7, you know, you must totally destroy them or destroy them totally. You know what the next verse says? And then don't intermarry with them. Why would he say that after saying destroy them totally? Because some say, like Dr. Paul Copan, who teaches at uh, Palm Beach Atlantic University. I'll actually see him tomorrow night because we're going down there to university. But anyway, he wrote the book, Is God a Moral Monster? He points out that... This kind of language was very common in the ancient Near East, and it didn't literally mean murder everybody or kill everybody. 
It meant to defeat them soundly. That's why drives out. You're driving the people out of the land. So it could mean that when God said that, what he meant was to drive them out and defeat them soundly, not literally kill everything, even though some of the language says that. Now, the other interpretation is it is literal. Destroy everybody. If it is literal, can God do that? Of course he can. I mean, think Nazi culture. Did we kill Nazis after the war? Yeah, we sure did. The ones that were the war criminals, we brought them to Nuremberg. Yeah, because that, they were guilty, quite obviously. And that ideology needed to be stamped out. In fact, what did we do to the Japanese after World War II? We said, you can't even have a military. That's how serious we are. Because the Japanese were even more cruel than the uh, Nazis. 56% of, of people that were in J uh, Japanese prisoner of war camps died in World War II. One to two percent died in Nazi camps. And we said, this ideology can't continue. It's a cancer that needs to be stamped out. Now, God obviously has the authority to order capital punishment if that's necessary. We don't, un unless in a just war, that kind of thing. But God does. Go ahead, Dennis. You got something? Frank, what you're sharing tonight is, <clears throat> is so timely. Um, every, everyone in the country needs to hear this because that's exactly the direction that we're going. It was interesting that ran across three articles my wife found today and just want to share this with you. And this is just three of them. The Bible is challenged in Florida district to be removed because of explicit and sexual content. But we're going to let the drag queen come in and twerk before the <clears throat> three-year-olds. Okay. Then we got another one. Utah primary schools, they banned the Bible for vulgarity and violence. Mm. After a Colorado Spring district banned several other books, they decided to buy ban the Bible as well for explicit sex and violence. Mm. So it's happening across America right now as you're speaking. So the Holy Spirit is really leading you mm. to bring this subject to a focus because it's happening in front of our eyes and people are just getting numb to it to where we're seeing it go exactly the same way that, that it's gone for thousands of years. And yeah, of course, really the, the, the distinction that is never made in that situation is the Bible, of course, is the foundation of Western civilization, or at least a primary foundation of Western civilization. Secondly, what's in the Bible is not gratuitous. What's in the Bible is history. And it's pointing out uh, what evils were done and how God judged those evils. When you look at the kind of material that we're now, found, we're now finding in elementary school uh, libraries, that is gratuitous sex trying to encourage kids to engage in that kind of behavior. The Bible is trying to tell you to stay away from it, even though it's describing it. In other words, it's descriptive, not prescriptive, whereas the garbage they're putting in these schools for these kids is actually trying to get them to do that. But you know what? I would be totally, my compromise position would be, okay, take the Bible out, fine. Take all the other crap out with it, that stuff that you want, to, and we'll call it even. Fine. They're not going to read the Bible in school anyway. <laughs> but get all that other pornography that you're trying to push down our kids' throats. Get it out. But it's a culture that will move it into them. You, you won't find the Bible in, in communist countries. Because oh, of course not. Communism, there's no hope. They want to take the hope out of the entire world. And it's coming after America in a strong way. In such yeah. a way to where if they can remove the Bible, they can remove hope. Yep. Yep. It's the most dangerous book sure to uh, a tyrannical government out there. Yep. All right, we got Terry up here and DJ and here I'll come back. Go ahead, Terry. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Mm -hmm. You know, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. That sounds like me. That's our only answer to get out of this mess. When it says if my people, are they talking about the Christians, or are they talking about all the people? Neither. 
neither. That what verse, once again, there's no verses in the Bible. That verse is talking about when Solomon dedicated the temple. So although we often quote that because it sounds good, and it's true that you do want to call on God to heal your nation, but you can get that from other passages, that particular passage there is not speaking about America. It's speaking about dedicating the temple. Right, right after Solomon delegate, dedicated the temple, it's, it's second, what, second Chronicles 7.14, right? Yeah, it's that, that's the passage there. That's the application there. Okay. Well, I mean... I think that sentiment is true. You just look to other scriptures for it, right? I mean, Proverbs, what, Pro- what does Proverbs 29.2 says? This is something like, when the, righteous, uh, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan, right? Another proverb says, a good king, um, I can't remember the exact phraseology, but a good king... Uh, ferrets out evil, he drives a threshing wheel over them. See, a a good king, someone who is providing the right government, is someone who's going to protect innocent people from evil, as Paul says in Romans 13. And so you have to stamp out evil if you are uh, a good servant of God as a king or some sort of politician. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, what law is, is morality codified. That's all it is. All laws legislate morality. The only question is, whose morality? That was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. So what we need to do is, be, is get involved at the government level as we're involved at every other level and make sure that righteousness prevails. Look, if you love people, you'll want good laws put into place. You won't want people to actually be hurt by bad laws or laws that don't exist that allow evil people to hurt other people. Over here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, Frank, my question is about Moloch. Moloch, so, yeah. Moloch. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure you've heard um, Bohemian Grove. What is it? So that's the place where Alex Jones basically exposed it in California. He recorded a video. And they were praying. Was it? It was to Moloch, right? Like there was a bunch of people, uh-huh. like elites, like elite. Uh-huh. They were sounds from right. So they were play, praying to I think Moloch, uh-huh. and obviously there's a lot of like um, I don't know if it's necessarily child sacrifice, but it's a lot of pedophilia and stuff like that, including in Hollywood because it's a, like a lot of Hollywood elites that yeah, are. Isn't it in interesting there. that the. Uh the Hollywood tried to suppress the Sound of Freedom movie. Why? It's about sex trafficking. I thought the right and the left could come together on that. Apparently not. Apparently sex trafficking is getting a little too close to, close to home for some people in Hollywood or on the left. They don't even want that exposed. Right. Why is that? I'm just asking the question. Something's going on. Yeah. They tried to say it was some kind of QAnon, what is that? I don't even know what that is. What is that? Q, QAnon or was some kind of conspiracy thing? Okay, in order to basically diss it, to try and say it's got no credibility, rather than saying, yes, yeah, sex trafficking's going on, and this is actually a true story of a guy who worked for Homeland Security who rescued kids from the sex trafficking industry. And, and they couldn't get behind that? No, apparently not. Why is that? I don't know. Probably is. Probably is. Yeah, I mean, I think my my question was basically <laughs> like the linkage. Have you found any, you know, oh, similarities to I, what's I, happening? I, there I, I, with, I haven't been that. able to. It's really hard to know what's true anymore, isn't it? What really is true about this kind of stuff? I'm just trying to look at whether or not the scriptures have external verification on these issues, and they do. I mean, yeah, hang on, we we, we got to we got to stay on the mic. But no, someone else, someone else was up here. Did you have a, a question, San Antonio? Oh, you did, DJ. Go ahead. We got to stay on the mic because people are watching out there. They can't hear you. Yeah, go ahead, DJ. Yeah, I, I think first to answer your question about um, the bail. I think the uh-huh. reason why there was so much stuff with cows is because bail was always in the mood. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> that is like the ultimate dad joke. <laughs> right there. I just, I just, I just, I just had to lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> but uh, on a. <laughs> On a, on a serious note, uh, has there ever been any, I guess, study to why the 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 followers of Yahweh? I mean, they're watching God do all these miracles. Why they would get seduced by like the Molex and the Bales and the Asherah if they were like watching him? It's not like I mean, you had the cloud and the miracles; yeah. like they were there. Have you have you ever gotten fickle about what you believe? Not since becoming an adult, no. <laughs> No? I mean, do you ever, like, God, where are you? When you had God intervening in your life several times in the past, it's like, what's, what have you done for me lately, God? Right? Gee, I forgot. I mean, we're so fickle. I, it, it, it doesn't amaze me to say that the people that saw miracles with their own eyes later came to doubt. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't amaze me at all. I think that's human nature. I think we're fallen. I think we're weak. I think we're forgetful. I think we're so addicted to comfort and how we want things to be that when things don't go our way, we just go, well, God doesn't exist, or God, you're not paying enough attention to me, or this or that. I just think that's human nature. I mean, you look at miracles throughout the Bible. Most of the time, they didn't have what we would consider would be the proper response, where people would go, whoa! I mean... I think Caiaphas knew Jesus was the Messiah. He knew Lazarus had risen from the dead, and yet he still wanted to kill Jesus. It's better that one innocent man die than the whole nation perish. So, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not surprised by that at all. Anyone else? Anyone online? What do you got, Clint? Um, what, what are the Frank's thoughts on the privacy argument for abortion the privacy argument for abortion that you have a well you generally have a right to privacy but you don't have a right to a private right to kill people to murder people so there, there's no private right to murder people I always found that an odd argument to make and this really comes from Roe v Wade where, where they found in a penumbra which is trying to read between the lines of the constitution a right to privacy even though the word isn't even in the constitution okay and yet even if they were to find a right to privacy there is no civilization anywhere that says you have a private right to murder people how is that a right to privacy i don't, I don't understand why people would even make that claim yet somehow people buy it as if it's a good claim every single argument for abortion is an argument for infanticide I mean, if you have a private right to kill them before they're born, why not after they're born? If uh, you have a right to kill them because they're going to put a financial burden on you, why not do so after they're born? If you're afraid they're not going to be wanted before they're born, well, why not kill unwanted children after they're born then? I mean, you could just go on and on with this. It makes no sense, the arguments that the uh, pro-abortionists come up with. And notice how they get more and more shrill as the walls of the law start closing in on them. In other words, as states begin to ban abortion, the blue states began to actually pull restrictions, reasonable restrictions against abortion. Like you can't kill your kid in the ninth month. Oh no, now you can do it, and maybe even after they're born. It's actual, just one big rebellion against the truth. That's what it is. It's all about rebellion. Go ahead. What else you got there? Um, how, do, how do we know that the rules against different sexual laws are still applicable for today? Well, most of them are in the natural law. Most of them you don't even need the Bible. I mean, you know you're not supposed to have sex with your aunt, right? You know you're not supposed to have sex with your grandchildren. Or, and all these things are dogs or uh, beasts or... That seems quite obvious, and I think the same is true with homosexuality. You intuitively know that. Now, that can be suppressed out of you, or it can be propagandized out of you by a culture. In fact, let me ask you this. Would anybody 100 years ago ever try and suggest that the Bible supports same-sex relationships? Nobody would ever try and make that argument 100 years ago. Yet you have people now trying to make the argument. Why? Because it's the culture. 
the culture has accepted homosexuality and celebrates it, so now we've got to find some sort of justification in the Bible for it. Nobody would do that 100 years ago. It's just showing you that the culture often colors how people think. So your conscience can be seared. It can be knocked out of balance by bad culture and bad education. But when you're old enough to know what murder is and you're old enough to know what wrong is, you know that murder's wrong. When you're old enough to know what bestiality is and what wrong is, you know bestiality's wrong on the basics. So, there are, of course, other ways you can know from the Bible. Paul says, flee sexual immorality. What was sexual immorality in his day? All the stuff we listed in Leviticus 18. When Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of a man that makes him unclean, what was he talking about? When he said, sexual immorality makes him unclean? What was sexual immorality to him? The same things that we listed in Exodus 18. The only proper sexual behavior would be sex inside of the marriage of a man and a woman. Anything outside of that, including homosexuality, adultery, fornication, bestiality, rape, any of those things, was immoral. So Jesus spoke to these issues. He just spoke to the category, sexual immorality. He didn't speak to every single individual aspect of Leviticus 18. He just put them under one category and said it's sexual immorality. It would be like somebody today saying, the Bible doesn't say anything against felony home invasion. Yeah, but it says thou shalt not steal, okay? It talks about the category theft, even if it doesn't enumerate every single species of theft. It would take too long, right? It's just talking about the category. In fact, that's one of the categories Jesus Jesus mentions when he says, what makes a man unclean? It's what... It's what comes out of him. Sexual immorality, theft, covetousness, many other things. Hang on, we need the, we need the mic. And then we'll go over here. I was just going to make a comment mm-hmm. just based off of culture. I didn't, I didn't know if you guys knew that 40% of the students – at Brown University now identify with the LGBTQ+. <laughs> yeah, which just goes to show you, it's social media and culturally driven, right? I guarantee you 40% of those kids aren't engaging in that behavior. They identify with it. In other words, they're allies of the people who do engage in it. But is there something new in the water? Is there something new in biology? Is there some new new aspect of humanity that is now causing 40% of people to say they're LGBT. No, that's not. It's all driven by the culture. So you're not really following your culture. In fact, you're not really following the truth. You're following your culture. Tim Keller had a great illustration of this. He went to Wheaton University a number of years ago, and he was talking about uh, sexual immorality and uh, sexual orientation and the fact that people today say, follow your heart. In fact, a couple of sessions from now, we're going to take a break from the archaeology and talk about that. Follow your heart, transgenderism, all that stuff. In any event, Keller pointed out, he said, let me give you an example of why you're not really following your heart, you're following your culture. He said, imagine a guy a thousand years ago in Norway, he's a Viking, and he has two contradictory desires on his heart. One is he wants to crush people to get what he wants. The other is he has same-sex desire. Which one of those two desires is he going to elevate and which one of those two is he going to suppress? He's going to suppress same-sex desire because that's not tolerated in his culture, but he's going to elevate the idea that he wants to crush people because culturally he's going to be rewarded for that. That's what those people did, right? Now take that same guy and put him in Manhattan, San Francisco, or even Charlotte today. He has those same two desires. Which one is he going to suppress and which one is he going to elevate? He's going to suppress toxic masculinity because you can't be that. And he's going to elevate same-sex desire because he's going to get applauded for that. Is he following his heart or is he following his culture? Culture. He's following his culture. Yeah. Yeah, you think you're, you're not following your heart. Well, you may be following an aspect of your heart. 
but you're really taking cues from your culture on what is acceptable and what isn't. Right. Need the mic back. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, DJ. Go ahead, oh, yeah. and then we'll go over there. <coughs> well, yeah, s speaking of what you said about uh, kind of going to more children identify with LGB, yeah. uh, was it now LGBTQQIPS, IP2SAA? That's the new letters. I mean, and you look at more and more, we have two-spirit, androgynous, asexual, queer, questioning, intersex, non-binary, <laughs> pansexual, uh, maps, yaps are considered um, youth attracted persons, um, uh, minor attracted persons. I mean, fairies are included. As I mean, we'll see so when we get to that session, all those are contradictory. They can't all be true at the same time. You can't both believe in fixed genders and all genders are fluid at the same time and in the same sense. We'll get to it. Yeah, go ahead. No, just comment to piggyback off the, the, the uh, online question. I. I would say, you know, nature will root it out. I mean, one of the questions is, why don't we know that today? Well, nature root, roots why it out through what today? Um, intersex amongst family members. I mean, you, oh. you, you, it's apparent through genetic, genetic disorders mm -hmm. um, and that sort of thing, um, as evidenced by the, the Egyptians, the pharaohs, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, and when, when, they, when, when people point out anomalies in, in, uh, or when they point out to the they point to the nature uh the animal kingdom as evidence of uh you know homosexuality where there's examples of you know these monogamous types of animals that that will have a partner for life like penguins and such and they point to the animal kingdom as as evidence of why homosexuality is 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 apparent in humans or should be apparent in humans or could be it's ridiculous i mean if we point to the animal kingdom Lions eat their young. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of examples of why we don't use the animal kingdom as a standard for how we uh, behave. That's right. Yeah. They're looking down rather than looking up. They're looking in the wrong direction for their standard. Nature just tells you what is. It doesn't tell you what you ought to do. Right. Anybody else, Clint? No. All right. Oh, we got one up here, and that'll be the last one. Go ahead, Gary. Don't know how to frame this as a question, but kind of curious. There's a lot of um, when you think about babies and violence. Uh -huh. There's a lot of um, slaughtering of societies, and within it, it's interesting that God brings out the fact that you know they're, they're slicing open pregnant women and dashing young children to the ground to mm -hmm. kill them as a way of of slaughtering them. But uh, maybe we're going to get to that in the future, but it seemed to be the same thing that God's bringing out the fact that this is an evil way of, mm -hmm. of destroying a people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, but I, I submit to you, we're just do, we're doing it now, but we're doing it in a quieter way. Yeah. We're doing it in clinics where nobody sees it. You know, you could end abortion in this country if you were to show uh, commercials and uh, ads and had TV programs on what actually happens in an abortion. But pe the demons would be screaming. In fact, you know how hard it is to find some of the images I found? It took me a couple hours to find just even these images because Google won't let you find them. Mm -hmm. I had to go to Wisconsin Right to Life to find those images. And if I were to put a little movie that I normally show on a caseforlife.com website, I usually show this little one-minute video that shows you abortion in three different stages, uh, YouTube would ban it. YouTube banned it last time I showed it. Yeah. The truth is too much. You can't allow the truth to get out. But everybody knows what's in there. It's a human being. It's not a squirrel. You know, it's not a raccoon in a woman's in a woman's uterus, you know, we know what's in there. All right, a couple things before we go. Um, we've had some requests uh, for uh, opening this up to two genders. Not, not more than two, <laughs> just two. <laughs> and uh, what's that? Oh, it, you can leave it on for a minute, yeah. Uh, well, you, 
yeah, these guys can hear this. We're in a men's Bible study, but there's some ladies that want to come to this. And, uh, you know, we really don't talk about anything that's just germane to men. So I don't have a problem with it. If you guys don't have a problem with it, open up. You can bring your wives, kids, whatever you want. Anybody can come. You guys okay with that? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put a few more chairs in here if we get a few more people. We'll, we'll make it work. Yeah? Uh-huh. Oh, all right, we'll bring her along. Oh, she likes it out there. Uh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> all right, well, that'll still be available. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, so we're going to say goodbye.